Okay, thank you for inviting me, invite, me at uh, this conference. So uh, I will say that I have a very ugly title about uh, uh, what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to talk about uh, Internet of Things. On Internet of Things, you have Internet. And so I will make a, a presentation about uh, Internet, which is a very, very uh, specific thing about what all we have seen. So if we think about Internet of Things, I think right now we are about, at this, at this time, about 30 years ago when a computer arrived, or microcomputer arrived, and you have to invent everything on it. You have an hardware, you have some software, and you have to develop new things, and you were very free to develop all you want on, on that kind of thing. Now we have a, we had a presentation of Arduino, and we are about at the same position because now we c you can do you can imagine everything uh, and build everything with that. We are, you are very very free to do it. In fact, in the future maybe it will be different because, for example, if you look now, you don't have any more uh, microcomputer, but you have a tablet and it's very very uh, close, so you cannot do what you want. But at that time, for Internet of Things, you have a lot of freedom. So my first uh, part of my talk will be to talk about Internet and give some definition of Internet. So I'm very sorry because in our uh, community, we, we use a lot of acronyms. And so I will have a lot of acronyms, but I put some funny animation. And maybe this way, I will compensate uh, the, the use of acronyms. So first, what is Internet? So, in fact, if you look at Internet, we, we talk a lot about one protocol, which is at the center of Internet, which is the IP protocol, Internet protocol. And, in fact, if uh, when I started, when I arrived here at uh, Telecom Bretagne in, uh, in the 90s, when I talk about Internet, I was very enthusiastic about Internet because I discovered it at the INRIA. And I, I w just want to work in a company where internet was uh, available, and in that, that time there was not a lot of people that offer this, uh, these services. And if you talk to uh, some uh, company, for example France Telecom, or uh, and you talk about internet, they say, "Oh no, internet is not a very good protocol. We have something that is much much better, which is X25, a frame relay, ATM." and it's really fitted to the core network. Now, if you talk to other companies like Microsoft or Novel, and you say, I want to put internet into companies to, uh, to interconnect computers, this person will say, oh no, IP is not a very good protocol. We have a, be a better protocol, which is NetBIOS or IPX, which offer much functionalities than IP. And now, what we see is that we have IP everywhere. Why we have IP is not because it's the best protocol in some place, but it's a good protocol everywhere. And this way, we can create interconnection. And the value of the network is not the protocol by itself, but it's the way you can communicate with other people. So interconnection is the most important topic. And that's what one reason of uh, the why IP wins is because it offers this interconnection. It's become more and more popular, so you have more and more people that go to the network, and this way, you have a unique protocol. So this is impor very important right now, because when we go to the Internet of Things, we will, hear, we will hear again this, this, uh, this talk. If I say, my protocol is better for this object, because he managed in a better way the energy, or uh, is uh, smaller than this protocol. But in fact, what is still important is interconnection. So we will see that uh, again. So as I say, IP is a very, very uh, successful model because it started about 30 years ago, and we are still using it, which is something very strange in the computer industry because we move from protocol to protocol very, very quickly, usually. So it was not designed to con it was just designed to connect computers. And we are using it right now to other things like voice over IP, television over IP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have a lot of new services that arrive over IP, and we use IP also on new links that were, didn't exist when the protocol has been developed. So this drawing 
come from the uh, internet community, the IETF, which do standardization, and it's what we call the hourglass model, and says that IP is at the center, IP is at the interconnection between application layers and interfaces as a way you can send the information. And if you know a little bit about uh, network, normally we talk about the OSI model, and you have different blocks that are the same size, and you put them together. Here, in fact, people from IP say our protocol is very small and has to ke be kept very small because it's in this way you can interface easily application to the way to, transfer, to, to transport the information. Because the surface between application and IP is small and the surface between IP and the interface is small. Another thing that is a design thing from IP is that IP has to be implemented everywhere on every uh, devices, router, server, and also your laptop, your uh, smartphone. So this is one model. This architectural model is a big success because we still have IP in, on the network. And there's also some studies that show that this model is quite logical. So there is people from um, Georgia Tech that make a kind of uh, game of life for protocols. So Game of Life, you know, is you have cells, and if a cell is alone, in, uh, it disappears. If there is too many cells around the cell, the cells also die. Uh, but if the cell doesn't have too much cells around, then the cells can survive and create other cells. So we can do the same with protocols. So we develop a protocol, we have some application, we have some way to transform, transport the information, and we put new protocol, some protocol arrives, some protocol disappear, and we see how the structure of the network evolves, of the architecture evolves. And what is very strange is that when you do that, you see that in the middle, somewhere, you have only at one layer, you have one protocol that survives. So here, it's uh, mapping to IP protocol or IP environment, and you see that in the middle, we have this IPv4 a protocol that survives because it's very popular on everything. Uh, everything IP relies on all the um, uh, transmission layer, or everything relies on, on IP. So that's good, but when we discover that there was a problem with IPv4, because IPv4 developed an addressing scheme on 32 bits, and it was not enough for all the computer, and it will not be enough if you want to interconnect everything else on IP, then people wanted to push another version of a protocol, which is IPv6, that gives almost, uh, uh, an, uh, almost infinite, infinite number of addresses, so you can connect everything. The problem is that if you look at these two drawings, the first one is that you have to push everywhere IPv6 on all the devices, but also the ecosystem will resist and we'll say, no, we continue to stay on IPv4 because this is the dominant protocol. So this model is successful, works well, but it leads, so it offers interoperability, but it offers also ossification, and it's very difficult to make it evolve. So that's a problem because we want IPv6 on the network because IPv6 is good, because it's a way to, uh, to have more things connected to, to the network. So we have to find so, some way to do it. So as I say, uh, I work for, uh, for IPv6 for, for many, many years to try to push it on the network. So it's uh, very difficult to do it because we have all this ecosystem that resist. But for the Internet of Things, so fast content is not a problem. If you go to web surfing, you can have some way to, to continue to, to play with IPv4. But for the Internet of Things, IPv4 is not fitted for. So we have to find a way to introduce IPv6 in the network, even if the large majority of the network is still IPv4. And here, we can make a difference between two Internet. One is the Internet of Things, that will need IPv6. And one is the Internet of Content, so it's when you are surfing on the web. And this Internet of Content, will need IPv6 in the future. Provider still uh, wants to push IPv6, but it will be more difficult to, to introduce it. So why do we need IPv6 for Internet of Things? 
for different reasons. First one is that since the address are larger, we can have auto configuration. And for a thing, it's very important because a thing doesn't have a keyboard, doesn't have a screen, so you have to put it on the network and it has to work. So it's something very important. Other thing is that IPv6 is simpler than IPv4, and a thing has a limited space or limited memory, so you have to have a protocol that is simpler. And the last thing is related to the hourglass model I showed you before, is that IP is agnostic to any layer, so you can put any way of transmitting information on, on the network. So that's some good advantage for IPv6. But IPv6 is quite old now. It's about 20 years. So we have to make it evolve to put it on the things. And it's what I, I will show you on, on this presentation. <coughs> so the, the other thing we people talk about IP is end-to-end. -end. So uh, I don't know how to say in English, but in French is uh, cream pie, is that everything has to be, if a thing has to be good, it has to be end-to-end. And so, what does it mean for internet? It means that the scope of application, so the scope of layer seven, is the same as the scope of layer three, so the way to send the information from one point to another. The problem is that when you put more and more computer, when you, mo you put more and more application on the network, then the scope of layer three cannot evolve as fast because we have the, this problem of addresses, so we have to divide the network in several pieces, and we have network address translation uh, between these pieces. So we break, we, it, break, it breaks a little uh, the end-to-end -end model. So that's why IPv6 has been designed to suppress this architecture and to have something that is end-to-end -end at a larger scale. But the problem is that right now, we have new things that arrive. It's, of course, Internet of Things. An Internet of Things has different properties from computers. First thing, they have to be cheap, very cheap, because you will put sensor everywhere and you want to connect it on the network. So, and if you look at the more loose that say that the power of computer or CPU is increasing every year, in fact, here, you will not increase the power of your object but you will decrease the price of your object. So you will still, you will remain in a very constrained environment with low memory and low energy. So that's one problem. The other problem is that time cycle for object is totally different from the time cycle from the uh, transmission of the computer industry. For example, who has a, a mobile phone that is, um, is more than for three years? My question is clear. One, two, and four, and less than three years. Okay, you are not students. But uh, in, no, normally, you change your mobile phone every one or two years. So it's a way to implement new protocols and make uh, the network evolve. When you have things, things exist before internet. So they don't have internet in them. So we have to, um, to, if we want to interconnect them, we have to deal with elements that doesn't have internet on it, or IP protocols. Things also have to last for a long period of time. For example, if you put an electric meter, it will, it will have to last 20 years. So it means that what we are doing now, the design we are doing right now, we have to, to support it for about 20 years. So the mistake we are doing right now, we have to support them for 20 years. So it's different scale, so it's very difficult to, to put that in, the, in IP model. So how to do that? We have two solutions. One is to forget about IP for Internet of Things, and it's more to go to an interconnection at the application layer. So for, uh, to have different things on the bottom and to say that we are just applications that talk together. So it's a trend that is very uh, attractive right now and I will explain how we can do that. The other way to do this is to adapt IPv6 to this environment. 
So the ITF is working on that uh, part, and I will show you some way to do it, but there is still a lot of constraints that are not covered by the, by the ITF, and uh, made that is not for all the devices. So, just some vocabulary, and that's my vocabulary. Everybody has its uh, vocabulary about the uh, Internet of Things. So I will give you my classification of uh, different uh, topics. So the first thing you can have, and it's what, what you have right now in the market, is what we call connected objects. So connected objects doesn't care that much about IP. They use normally Bluetooth or Bluetooth low energy, and they talk with your smartphone, and your smartphone is doing some XML file and send this XML file to the, to the cloud. So there is no research here. You can design products. So you can buy a lot of things, uh, your uh, electronic cigarette with uh, um, uh, connected electronic cigarette or your fork, etc., etc. So you, you see a lot of things that can be connected, but they don't communicate each other. So you can know how many uh, cigarettes you smoke, but you don't know, uh, you cannot use this value on another program. So you don't have interconnection. So IETF is doing, so I will call it Internet of Things because IETF is uh, the, the standardization organism for IP, so it's the internet. So they develop new protocols and these protocols are called 6 lopan It's an adaptation of IPv6. You have Ripple, which is a routing protocol for IPv6, for the Internet of Things. And you have Coop, which is a limited vision of uh, uh, HTTP. And I think that is the most important buzzword or keyword that you have to, to see with the Internet of Things, because it's something very, very interesting. And there have also some standardized representation of information is JSON, based on JSON, or more compressed version of JSON. So this is the ITF, so we will put IP everywhere, and we will try to make objects communicate together. And you have HC, HC uh, with uh, I, it's uh, European Standardization uh, Institute, that developed GSM, and now is working on a standard that is called hcm 2 m and now it's a global standard, it's called 1M2M, and it's based only on the REST approach. And the, goal, uh, the advantage of this is that it uh, can connect legacy devices that never heard about IP. So that's some, uh, something important. And this approach is provider-oriented. As I said, now we are free, we can imagine everything, but big companies wants to be at the center of the market. So this approach is to say that telecommunication provider will be in the center of the market. But you have other competitors like Apple, Google, that tries also to uh, define some standardized way to uh, represent the information from sensor. So, as I say, we are going to focus a little bit of in, in Internet of Things, viewed by the Internet. So, the way is to adapt IP to a constraint environment. And so they use IPv6 because only IPv6, so you forget about IPv4 in that environment. And it's for, uh, as I say, auto configuration and the fact that it's layer two agnostic. You can have a routing protocol, and one of them is Ripple. So Ripple has been, is a very huge uh, protocol. Very versatile, you can put it on different kind of environment. You have a lot of parameters, so you need a lot of expertise to run on this environment, but it's something that can be, uh, can be very standard for all uh, the Internet of Things. And you have this representation using uh, JSON and COP. So Zigbee is the first organism that uh, uses this uh, architecture. In fact, it's a Zigbee forum that push IETF to develop this architecture. And now you have Google with Thread that use also this kind of architecture to interconnect objects. So just to show you the difference between, for example, Zigbee stack and what is, from our point of view, the mistake of the Zigbee stack compared to what the IETF is proposing, is that in the Zigbee, when you buy a Zigbee product, 
normally you have application an application use addresses from the network or for layer 2 it means that if you want to change your layer 2 you have to change your application and that's a, a big problem for the stack so Zigbee is using this stack for all the products uh, but Zigbee Smart Energy is using an IP stack and you see the difference here is that you have, we can have different uh, link layer in gray in the picture. We have this IPv6 or 6 lopan that makes the communication between the different uh, elements. You have Reaper as a routing protocol. And bef between the application and IPv6, you have either TCP, HTTP in the standard way, or UDP and co-op for uh, the object when you have some constraints. So what is interesting to see here is that we have three different layer level of addressing. So at layer two, we have the MAC address, which is embedded in the device. Then we have the IP address, IPv6 address, and then we have the URI. What is important to notice is that, in fact, we can embed all of them. It means that the IPv6 address can embed the MAC address, and the URI can embed an IPv6 address. But we are free to do something else. So we have a freedom to move from uh, one representation to another, which is not possible in the initial Zigbee representation, which makes it very, very uh, constrained to or linked to uh, uh, A3.8.2.15.4. So we have a lot of freedom. We, or we, find, we, look, we recover the freedom from uh, IP, and we can compress things. So normally, when people show uh, the way we compress IPv6, I like uh, hexadecimal uh, representation, so you, you have here an IPv6 packet. So what is important to notice is that you see that the addresses are in uh, purple, and so they are very, very long because it's IPv6. But the good news is that you can compress them. And in fact, if you use 6 lopan, instead of 40 bytes, you can have up to 4 bytes. So you can divide by 10 the, the, the size of uh, IPv6. So it's very, very convenient for objects. But that's for local traffic. When you go to global traffic, and if your objects want to talk with any element on the internet, he will use Gobra addresses, and here the compression is not that good. It means that you have only uh, you lose only five bytes in the um, in the compression. So it's not a very good good compression. So from my point of view, it means that you don't have to think end to end, and imagine that any device will talk directly with any device because it's not efficient, and it can introduce some uh, some problem. So. What is more interesting to see when we study the Internet of Things is the REST approach or the client-server approach. So when we think about client-server, normally we imagine that the client is very small. It's, for example, your mobile phone. And the server is a Google farm. So you have very, very huge co computers. In fact, a server is not something that is huge. A server is something that knows and as a resource. So in our case, the server will be the tiny object you will put on the wall and has a re uh, limited lem memory, limited energy, etc., etc. So in fact, you, when you talk to your server, you talk to something that has very limited power. So that's why we have to adapt the protocol to something that is uh, lim uh, limited. So what do we have? We have a reality. On the sensor, for example, we make a resource from this reality. So you have a temperature. So you, have a tem uh, you will use a resource that is designed by temp and will have a value that is sensor. So what will do the client is to query for the resource temperature. Then we can give the value and, for example, is 25. So when we do that, it means that we have to normalize the way we represent the temperature, and the way we represent the result, and say that 25, for example, in Celsius, is not Fahrenheit or something else. So we can use that on IPv6, but as you know, IPv6 is not very popular. Everybody is on IPv4. And so how we can make things better than the Internet of comment, or content, where 
to have something in IPv6, you have to put all the elements of the chain in IPv6. And when everything is in IPv6, you can talk IPv6. Here is not the case. So what we will do, in fact, is to say that, for example, we will put a gateway. And this gateway will allow you to continue the, the get uh, request from the traditional world, where you, you talk IPv4, TCP, HTTP. So it's your mobile phone, for example. And your mobile phone will go to, to a uh, gateway. And the gateway will transform this request into something that is more fitted to the Internet of Things, and it's IPv6, UDP, and co-op. And this way, it will be transparent for everybody. It means that your mobile phone will continue to have the normal application. Your sensor works with IPv6 and don't, doesn't know anything else. And your gateway is agnostic to application. It means that here, I don't say which kind of application. I just have resources. Only resources is a name that points to a, a set of bytes. So this way, I have something that is very, very generic and allow the interoperability between objects. Of course, if my, my representation of information is well known. OK, and we are, you have some uh, over advantage, but uh, I will skip them. The only drawback we have right now is that this kind of thing breaks the end-to-end -end security. So you can have security in the Internet of Things part. You have, uh, you have security in the traditional Internet with uh, HTTPS. But when you want to make the connection between them, you have to set up your gateway. And if you set up your gateway, so it's not a universal gateway, you have to do something. And for a user, it's not very easy to, to do these kind of things. So that's a problem we have to look at. So the other example of architecture, which is based on REST, so this paradigm of resource, and is to extend the notion of resource. Resource is not only some uh, value that you take from the real world, but resource can be also a way to manage the information. So if I take uh, an example, it's like when you have an hard disk. On your hard disk, you have blocks. And if you are a super user, you can read all the blocks. And from these blocks, you are going to build a file system. And this file system will give you permission to read or to write a file. So here, in this model, it's the same thing. We have a block, it's a resource. And this resource can be used to carry information or to give you permission to access to that information or not. So that's the main idea of the model developed by VHC. So I will not go into details. We don't have a lot of time to do that. It's a standard about 1,400 pages of acronyms. So it's very difficult to, to read and very boring. But it gives you a very generic and secure uh, architecture for the Internet of Things. And that's something very important, because a thing can kill. If you have a computer, and somebody enters in the computer, maybe you are, you are going to lose a lot of information about your life, but it's not like a medical device that can kill you. So if we want to develop a system that will integrate these uh, kind of uh, medical devices, then we have to have a very good security. And you have to believe to that security. Because if you receive a spam that tells you, I will kill you if you don't send me $200 or $2,000, you have to say, this spam is stupid. I cannot, it's not possible to do that. Because if you imagine that it's possible, <laughs> then someone in the world will panic, and some of them will pay this amount of money. So it means that we, have to, we need a very, very secure system. And HC can build this uh, kind of secure system. But, of course, you have a cost, and the cost is complexity. OK, so to, uh, to conclude, so I give you a scope about uh, what, we, what is Internet of Things. So I will uh, tell what we are going to, to do in REN, and we, are st we, we start to do it uh, at Telecom Bretagne, and we are going to spread it in, uh, in REN right now, is to combine Something very, very interesting is long-range radio. So you have, you have different technology. You have one technology by Semtech, which is called LoRa. And we have Fab Labs. 
So we say, okay, we are going to develop a, a program that is called Laura Fabian. So it's an um, ugly name for, for the pr program. But uh, the goal is to allow people to develop new applications using this long-range radio. And this long-range radio has good properties. For example, if you put an antenna in the center of Ren, you have a cover coverage about one kilometer. If you put it on, uh, outside of Ren, of Ren, you have about 30 kilometers. And so you have some uh, companies that are right now developing some services. You talk about Sigfox. You have Actility also that develop these, uh, these services. But it's a closed system. You cannot enter into the system. So what we are going to provide is an environment when people can build their own uh, object that can communicate to some antenna we are going to spread into REN. And this way, we can develop new services. So that's very interesting because we are going to develop new usage. So PR artists, uh, designers, students can imagine new products. That's very good. But for us, as a network engineer, it's also very important because these people will not think about traffic. They will not say, this traffic is good for the network, this traffic is not good for the network. So this way, we will have some new traffics, and we have to learn how to manage this traffic on the network. And on this network, we have a lot of constraints. It means that, for example, an, an antenna cannot send more than 30 seconds of information every hour. So it means that it's very uh, drastic constraints. And we are almost sure that if we do nothing, the network will collapse because it needs management. So we have to learn about that. So that's something important. The other thing is that what we have started to design is to, to include the internet on this uh, architecture. So to have a real Internet of Things, not something that communicates with the Internet, but have some kind of end-to-end, -end, but not layer 3 end-to-end, -end, layer 7 end-to-end. -end. And so we can also include some more complex things like HCM2M, but it's not the topic right now. But something that is important also is to prepare 5G, because it's something that arrive uh, at um, for a call, for example, for European project. So on 5G, you have, of course, you want to go at a higher rate with uh, higher speed, etc., etc. But there is another thing that is important is that right now, for example, when you are in 4G and you want to make a phone call, you are using 3G. If you want to send an SMS, you are using 3G. Because 4G, it's a big Wi-Fi. It only knows packets. And applications are built on the packet. So when, for example, you have a Coca-Cola vendor machine that want to send us SMS in 4G and 5G, then this Coca-Cola vendor machine has to implement a very large stack and have to send a lot of message before sending an SMS. So in fact, for object, 2G is better than 4G. So what is important here is to include long-range radio in 5G to allow communication for uh, this kind of devices. I am more finished. So just to show you a little bit about the architecture. So we are, what we are going to do is to use a layer 2. So it's the layer 2 from Semtech. And then we put co-op. So we forget, for example, here you don't see IPv6. We don't have routing part, so we don't need IPv6. And we are going to use co-op as a signaling protocol. This way, if we change layer 2 by another technology, we still have the same signaling protocol. And we don't do the same mistake as, for example, people have done like Microsoft with NetBIOS that say, I put my application on Ethernet, and if I change Ethernet, I have to modify my application. Here we have something that is more flexible. So I will not enter into all the details, but just to conclude, we have this model, of course. I say that the Georgia Tech results say that we have, we need, or we have one button, bottleneck in this hourglass, but this bottleneck, instead of being IP, can be co-op. And here you have a better naming capability because you have URI and you have more flexibility than IPv6. 
And so that can be convenient to have IPv6 if you need routing. If you don't need routing, you don't need to have IPv6 at least at the edge. And of course, in the core network, we continue to have a traditional vision of networking. And here we have IP to forward information at a very high rate. But when we arrive, arrive at the border, we have gateways. And this gateway, we interpret packets and we'll send them at, at layer 7. So it means that we, we can have different architecture that is not totally IPv6 oriented, but are still in the philosophy of what has been uh, made the success of the internet.